Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Talk Junkies, where tonight is going to be a very interesting and fun night, as every Sunday is interesting and fun, because I got two of my best friends here hanging out with me. I'm a very lucky man to have that in my life, being married and with two children, to be able to hang out with my best friends once a week. Nothing wrong with that. I'm all about it. But anyways, um, last week we had a, a pretty good podcast. We talked about just uh, the future of humanity and evolution with human beings. If you're interested in that kind of stuff, just take a, a, a you know a week back on our on our YouTube channel or iTunes or Spotify or whatever it is that you're listening on, and listen to last week's podcast. Very interesting stuff. Are humans going to eventually evolve into technology? That's kind of re- really where we hit it off. Yeah, but, covered a lot of transhumanism and AI and all yeah. that. And maybe we'll get that in, get, get into that with our guest tonight. But we're going to be talking about a little bit of different stuff. Um, we have uh, the pleasure of bringing on a, a gentleman I've known for a very long time now. Uh, since I was about 16, so 15, almost 16 years now that I've known him. That's crazy. Um, <clears throat> uh, hung out, know his brother very well. Um, just a pleasure to bring you on, Mikey. Thanks for coming on, man. I hit you up a couple of weeks ago, or maybe even a month ago on, on Facebook Messenger to have you come on to Talk Junkies, because I, I feel you have a lot of important information. And I'm not saying like drastically important, but I, I feel like you have a lot to say, man. Um, and, and welcome to Talk Junkies, and thanks for joining. How are you doing? Doing great. Yeah, I... Uh... I have a lot of opinions, so if you have the time, I'd love to talk about some of them. Right? <laughs> That's what we're here for. Yeah, man. This is the outlet. So tell us a little bit about yourself, man, whatever you're willing to give. Yeah, I uh, am a uh, youth development professional, professionally. Uh, that's, that's how I feed my family in different ways, so sometimes that means I'm providing therapy to kids or sometimes I'm uh, providing uh, other youth development. Um, I've been doing that for about 20 years. I've been uh, actively involved in lots of different kinds of community organizing and uh, labor organizing. I built a small labor community um, at my workplace uh, a couple of times and um, have filed uh, labor practice violations and one in federal courts for that kind of stuff. So I've been fighting a labor fight for many years as a, as a worker and a, a proud third generation union member. Um, I, through that, have gotten involved in labor organizing within prisons um, and, and the prison abolition movement. Um, I am a, a, a adamant believer that the uh, prison system needs to be abolished um, and that reform is is an impossible endeavor at this point. Um, and the way that the prison system is being utilized within our communities is harming our communities far more than uh, than any um, single crimes uh, put together can 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 accomplish. So, um, yeah, I do a lot of hanging out at home with my kids, uh, ranging from fourteen to two. Um, I, I teach them at home through some virtual programs, and uh, I get to live in the, in the sand dunes of western Michigan, about a mile from the, the beach, and, um, and, and help run, run a youth program seasonally there. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much me in a nutshell. Um, I, thanks for having me on. Um, I, I've had a, a lot of fun nights and a lot of discussions with with Paul in our uh, in our younger days, um, so yeah, it's been, it's been <laughs> nice. a while. It's nice to see you. You too, man. man there's you're... there's sand dunes in Western Michigan. That's what I was thrown off by, and all that. <laughs> oh. oh yeah, yeah. I, we, the the ecology there is fascinating. It's like um, like like the rainforests that are like in Oregon, right? Like everything's kind of covered in moss. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's like that, but when you pull the moss away, it's sand underneath. Uh, and then there's a lot of spots that are spe- like just open sand dunes, um, and and yeah, it's it's a it's a really interesting place to live. That's crazy. I just in that my mind, cool. whenever I think of like if anybody ever was if anybody was ever like you want to go out to the sand dunes, I would be like I'm I would not be like oh you mean the ones in Michigan, <laughs> <laughs> right, right. No, I got a sandy beach. I got sand dunes. I got forest. Um, got got it all uh right there so i spent a lot of time outdoors and um and hanging out just outside with my kids and more so, people more people should do that honestly yeah, i was lucky to get right like it was 
really, we moved to this camp uh, a month before uh, COVID set in, in in February of last year. So uh, the whole thing shut down and we had like the 300 acre site to ourselves. So damn, um, it was a blessing for us to very to much so have that happen like that. So. Well, let's, uh, let's yeah, get into yeah. the first topic. I think it's but very, yeah, now we live in an Airbnb. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, there is a little bit of a delay with Mikey for anyone who's listening out there, but we're going to make it work. We're going to make it happen. Um, so within your time w- uh, within doing what you're doing in the prison systems and you had just uh, stated that you think that maybe reform will not work, we need to actually abolish uh, the prison system that we have now. Um, where did it start for you whenever you first saw that? that that was something that the America should take a step in because we've all have talked about it on the pod- podcast before and it's a billion dollar corporation. So people are making money off of this, making money off people getting incarcerated. Um, solitary, it's modern day slavery. Yeah. Modern day slavery, um, solitary confinement, the effects that that has on someone's psyche and, and mental psyche. I recently heard a story of this guy who got a DUI and spent over 18 months in jail because they forgot about him. And he was in solitary confinement because he had mental issues he spent 18 months in solitary confinement for a DUI because they forgot about him. So I'm just kind of curious on where it began for you when you saw that there needed to be change in our prison systems. If you know, if to abolish it, sorry. Right. I mean, I think, uh, I mean, most working class people, uh, their interactions with the, the, that part of the justice system has not shown, um, to, to be rewarding. Um, whether it's people who have been victimized and how justice is served through the, the prison system or uh, people who have had family members who have who've been incarcerated. And so as a person who, um, who is a child of somebody who had been incarcerated at different points in my childhood, mostly because of mental illness, um, I early on <laughs> knew, knew that the, uh, the system was, was broken and um, and, and I, I couldn't understand like how we were, were here. So I spent early parts of my life knowing that it was a, 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 a disgusting system. Um, and it wasn't until I got involved with, with, uh, with some labor organizing groups that, that were specifically targeting those incarcerated people who are forced to labor in prison for private companies um, and, and helping them to, to organize for, for better conditions and for options to work or not. Um, did I really start to dig into what all of that meant? Um, and, and I mean, there's a realization that comes with a lot of people when they, they, they find out that the constitution really like supports slavery still, um, and, and was just used as a way to, to pivot, um, enslaving human beings for, uh, capital gain of, of, of private industry. Um, and, and so when, when that came to my realization, probably I'd say shortly after um, like Occupy Wall Street in 2009, 2010, um, it really came to my, uh, to my conscience that, um, that this was something that was, was happening on a large scale um, and that it needed to be resisted um, by people inside and outside of the system. And the people outside of the system needed to be taking cues from people inside of the system about how to make those systems more humane. Um, because the reality is, is most people who go into prison are going to come out of prison. Um, and if, if we want safer and more productive communities, um, let's just say the whole justice system was great. Um, those people are still going to come out uh, and we need them to come out better people than they went in. Um, otherwise we, we have a lot of other issues to handle in our communities. So, I wonder what the statistics are on people who've been incarcerated for, like, let's just say X amount of years, and then, like, what's their return rate almost? Because I could almost guarantee, from what I see, I don't actually have the numbers, but the fact that they're going to be incarcerated again because of the lack of opportunity, especially due to civil death that happens on, like, a federal level whenever you get a felony— and then you lose a bunch of civil rights and then you have this like, oh, well, this, well, they're literally backing me into a corner. There's nothing else I can do now but revert back to doing what I knew, which, which was crime. And they were like, I'm already used to prison, so like, fuck it. Like, I already know the lifestyle. I'm willing to go back. I just, I, I'm curious about those numbers. They have to be insane. 
no, yeah, no, they absolutely are. And I, I'm not a statistics person. That's just not the way my the way my brain works. So I don't remember exact statistics, but I know they're in the you know 70% range in in most places and most systems are are people coming back. And there's a lot of reasons for that. And you named a lot of really good ones. Um, some of them are systemic. I mean, there's a point where within this economic system that if you don't have enough money, it's criminal, right? Like you just can't, it's impossible to exist even and not become criminal um, in, in this economic system. So that on top of all the other stuff you discussed, on top of this like really strange probation parole system that we have that, um, that incarcerated it incarcerates people not because they've broken the law again or not because they've harmed somebody again, but because they couldn't come up with $50 on any specific week when they had to pay that money to go take a UA or to go see this professional or that professional. Um, and there's a whole profit complex behind that, that my, my industry as therapists, some people latch onto that and make a whole career out of, uh, out of collecting $50 at a time from, uh, from parolees. Um, so yeah, I can see when faced with uh, stealing a stereo to get the $50 to go to your court mandated therapist that week um, starts to become a real uh, liable option uh, to try to stay out of prison because you know, if you don't go, you're going to go to prison. Um, so that I mean, that needs to change. Um, and people spend so much of their lives and I mean, we have words for it, right? Career criminal. Um, we, we talk about these people that break the law um, and, and are perpetually in and out of the system. Uh, but we don't talk so much about people who break the law and aren't in and out of the system because the laws that they break um, aren't the laws that we lock people up for. Um, although they may be causing just as much harm or more harm uh, to our communities. So I think the biggest part of that, and I don't want to digress too much, but the biggest part of that that struck a chord with me is the fact that you, at the very beginning of that, you said that it's almost criminal to be poor. Like living in, living in poverty is almost a crime these days. And it's just crazy to me that to think that we never think about it because we're just like, oh, we're all the three of us in this room. We're all just middle class living our lives or whatever. But if it would take one day, one day out of our lives for a couple of things to go wrong, the wrong place, wrong time, a couple of things for you to all of a sudden have tons of legal fees, tons. Of, I mean, you could be hanging out with the wrong person like Paul. You could just be hanging out with the wrong person at the wrong time. And I mean, hopefully you don't put yourself in that situation, but you never know that it could just happen. And then all of a sudden, one day of your life turns into legal battles, court cases, money, money, money. I don't have enough money. Now I'm spending three years in prison to pay time for whatever this very small thing that could have been handled by just like talking to another human being and just being a decent person, like talking to a judge and being like, this is who I am. This isn't what I do, blah, blah, blah. But they just skip all that because it's all about money. And the whole, what you said, um, Mikey, about the just, I don't know. I, it, it just really resonated with me. The whole being poor is almost criminal in and of itself. Like that's, I've never thought about it that way, but so much of that adds up. And one, one thing that I've always thought to add on to that, any, anytime you have a crime that's punishable with a fine, uh, like a monetary fine, that's really only a crime for the poor. Mm -hmm. It's no longer a, a crime for for the rich. You can you can do that all day long. And a lot of like cultures have actually fixed that to where they'll go off a percentage based of your income to where if it's a speeding ticket, it's a percentage based to where it hits you the same. Because if I'm if I'm a billionaire I'll getting all day. getting yeah, getting a two hundred and fifty dollar speeding ticket and being able to hire an attorney means absolutely fucking nothing to me. Like that's a joke. So it's really a bunch of uh, like financial uh those level of crimes, I'm not talking about an incarceration at this point, but just to put into perspective how different uh, the class systems are in America uh, whenever it comes to the difference between the wealthy and the poor, when everybody should be right. equal, we're not. So just another example of that. But right. All that stuff applies. You can apply that same uh, line of thinking to the bail system, right? Like, and just that system in its, in its existence um, is, is a uh, oppressive system that really has no function because anyone who's dangerous, they're not going to get bailed to. Um, they just keep them locked up. They say, no, sorry, you don't get a bail. Um, so what's the point then? Um, it's to leverage, leverage more resources. Very much so. Have you done any research on like um, the beginning or how the prison system was implemented in the United States at all? 
Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there was really a shift after the Civil War, um, and it uh, prison populations. That was kind of really the first big boom, um, and and it stayed fairly concentrated amongst uh, uh, populations of Black and Hispanic men. Uh, a lot of vagrant laws uh, were passed that made it a crime to be poor and have nowhere to live. Um, some places it made it a crime to be uh, a male and and not working during working hours um, so that they could round up poor, uh, poor folks that had been slaves just a decade before um, and put them onto plantations again. Um, Angola Prison in Louisiana is a, uh, is a plantation um, and it was built as a plantation in its beginning and then it became a prison, it uh, became the state prison and it still operates as a plantation and there are uh, predominantly groups of black men in fields uh, tending to crops while white men on guns uh, ride horses around them. Um, and so it becomes a real ethical um, conundrum when you try to, to also balance kind of the things that these people have done um, and the ways that they've harmed their communities. Um, so I'm sure at some point, like that's something that we, we can dive into a lot of those like ethical considerations. Um, but when you look at the ethical considerations of the history of, of the prison system, um, specifically in the 1980s, um, thanks to our, in a large part, our current president, um, we, we saw a boom in, in the amount of people that were coming into prisons. Um, now the U.S. incarcerates more people uh, than, than any other country, um, possibly any other country in the history of the world. Um, we do in terms of percentage of our population. So, uh, has absolutely become uh, a monster. No, it's, it's crazy. I remember looking this up and this might've been from like 2012, 2011, something like that. But the United States at the time, which I know this is like a little outdated, you know, given it being 2011, 2012, I think it was 2012. We brought this up a few yeah, podcasts, but, but it was the, the, the United States has 1% of the world's population, but 25% of the world's incarcerated population, or was it a little less than 25, 23, 23%, 23% of the world's incarcerated population is in the United States. Given the fact that we have 1% of the world's population. There's something wrong there. You're not doing something yeah. right as a culture if you if you have that number. You're you're not looking you're you're putting a band-aid on a bleeding wound at that point and expecting everything to be good, but once again there's the financial side which you immediately is like the blinding light to the whole scenario that oh wow, they're actually making money off people being incarcerated, which is Super American, right? Like, like you know, very, who who cares? Very like, capitalist, money's, very yeah, privatized. Money's being made here, right? As, right. And, and as as Killer Mike says, slavery is the cornerstone of U.S. economics, right? Um, it always has been, uh, and it and it continues to be, um, and and that's coming from somebody who who calls themselves a capitalist, right? And uh, and uses uh, capital to to try to, to make uh, a, a, as big of a dent in, in his community as possible. But um, the fact is, is, is that not, it's not only that these systems exist and they profit, uh, and, and some people profit greatly, um, it's that our whole system has become dependent on, on this free labor um, that exists inside prison walls and has become dependent on a certain amount of labor being locked away um, and, and confined inside prisons and a whole complex of, of economics that surround it, um, that American corporations depend on the, the labor of these, these institutions. Um, so th that's why I say it's, it's impossible to reform because you can't reform that because once you start to reform one, one section of it, um, the, the pieces that are controlling it uh, will ensure that what needs to continue to happen will happen. Um, much like the views of like John Brown 200 years ago almost, right? Uh, uh, or nearly 200 years ago um, when, when he, he really looked at this uh, monster of slavery and said, there's no way out of this. Um, there's no way to like, 
try to legislate this, um, we have to end it. Um, and so that's, I think that's kind of the, the abolition movement that is, is moving now, um, is saying that this is, it has become so obvious, right? That these systems are oppressive um, and these, these systems are hurting our communities that any rational person can at least look at it and say that is not the way. Um, so at this point to me, like that's the baseline of a lot of the conversation is like, this is not the way. And then we can, as, as groups of people, we can start to articulate like, what are the ways? Um, and we can start to find better ways to do this. Um, but it's going to take like some real drastic like shifts. Yeah. I think that like, as opposed to just sitting back and watching this happen year after year, after tens of years, after hundreds of years of the same thing constantly happening. And we see that it's not really bettering society. Like you just described again, something has to change. And, and we, as people can't just push it to the side and just go about our daily lives and just work and, and pay attention to our family and our friends and forget about the people who are being inhumanely treated in these prison systems. Uh, a lot of them petty crimes. A lot of these crimes aren't really offensible to be sitting in jail for weeks, if not months, if not years at a time for a crime that really doesn't justify it. And again, these corporations and these prison systems are taking in uh, not only free labor, but billions of dollars of labor to benefit off of this. So you're completely right that something needs to change. And I don't think reform is the answer as you suggested, something has to change. A lot of tax money goes into it, too. A lot of our tax money goes right. into it, too. We're also paying right. for, for this horrible thing to happen out of our own pocket um, every every year. It's 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 a terrible right. thing. And, and let's say, and like, I have somebody who I understand people have different ethics, and I may not agree with somebody else's ethics, but if let's say your ethics say that these people who are in prison and did terrible things deserve everything they're getting, Right. Um, it's still at the end of the day drives down your, like your wage, um, because it, it, it changes that labor market, um, to where, to where now we have thousands uh, of jobs that people who are out of prison should be able to do, um, but instead are being done for 10 cents an hour. Um, and, and I never even not, looked at it that uh, way. I never even thought I about I that. I haven't thought of it either. That's really, really yeah. smart. I, and I don't want to keep, I feel like I keep picking out little parts that you're saying and then going off on a tangent about just that, but it still really interests me. I'm mad about the fact that we haven't, no, I love it that we haven't been like educated on the, the part that really stood out to me was when you talked about prisons really popping up and this change happening in the, uh, the 1860s or after the 1860s, that was the civil war, right? The, the 1860s civil war, I think anyways, um, that it really popped up after the Civil War, when you, which when you look at it like logically without blinders, it makes complete sense. After the Civil War, when you know slaves are freed and we've done all this kind of stuff, and they're still trying to, there's plenty of people still trying to keep slavery alive. What's the new? These, what's the new way to keep doing yes, this? Exactly. What yeah. is the new legal way to keep doing what we've always been doing? Well, let's just make these laws that are very much designed laws to keep the people that we want to keep incarcerated or under slavery or whatever. And I've never looked at it like that, never thought about it like that. And like I said, I'm more disappointed at the American education system for not teaching me these things because I learned about the Civil War. I learned mostly about the Revolutionary War because that's all they ever had time for. It seems like that drug out forever and they were bad about teaching us about anything else. But the little bits I learned about the Civil War, they don't bring up the systemic stuff that happens afterwards. You know what I mean? Like, they skip that and go straight to the 1960s and the civil rights movements and all this. They don't talk about the things that, like, these, the, I mean, they briefly mentioned Jim Crow laws and stuff, but all this stuff that is designed, and not just, I mean, it was targeted towards, like, black people, but it wasn't just that. It was just poverty in general and a certain, like, class of citizen and it's disgusting, A, that we don't learn it, but B, the fact that it even happened and that nobody looks at that or nobody knows about that, myself included. I didn't never even thought about that. Yeah, yeah. after a while, it, it stops to look, it stops to feel accidental after a while. Yeah, yeah that's what I'm saying. Yeah, no, that's 100% what I'm saying. And it's like, it's so obvious. That. You take off the blinders and you just mention it. Anybody with half a mind can like see that it logically leads there. Nice ringtone, bro. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's just crazy that it's like, it seems like such a common sense thing when you really think about it, but we never, 
we were never pushed to think about it. Right. And there's some, there's some great like theorists through, through history that you can turn to and people like Emma Goldman and, uh, and the, the folks at the, the Haymarket affair who, you know, the, the seven anarchists who were hung, um, for, with no, for no reason other than they were, uh, community leaders, um, and the, the local, uh, police didn't like their politics, um, and you can look through this like real history of folks that have been resisting this prison movement, this prison system um, that was designed to um, to maintain power and control um, from one class to another. Um, because if it was about saving lives, or if it about was about justice, or if it was about fairness, um, it would operate very differently. Um, the system is operating exactly as it was designed to do, um, and it is doing the task. Uh, that it was meant to do and it is doing what the people who fund it through our tax dollars and through our uh you know lot, lots of ways um have wanted to to function let me ask you and i know this is a really rough question um because we bring up problems all the time in this podcast we bring up problems with society with america with the world and in general all these different stuff and this is obviously this prison system is a problem so, and I know this is a difficult question. In a perfect world scenario, ignoring taxes, ignoring the transition, ignoring what it would take to actually do this, just perfect world scenario, is what is the alternative? And if you don't have one, that's fine, because I know that that's not easy to just fucking have a solution, but... Oh, yeah, no, there's been... Oh, yeah, no, there's a... There's literature upon literature upon literature that has lots of... of, of of ways to make this happen. And so it boils down to really a lot of individuals and what they think tactics are and good tactics. And I mean, personally, I think things like ending the bail system is a real like no brainer, boom. Um, if, if you've done something that we feel is, is so dangerous that we need to keep you away from society. Um, although I have a lot of even like critiques about that, but, uh, but we've got to start somewhere. So let's start with that bail system. Uh, let's change the way that we, uh, that we treat and that we support folks that are on probation and parole. Um, and let's end technical violations. And, and in terms of, of somebody going back to prison on a technical violation. Because they missed a parole um, date or something stupid like that. The... Right, right. Let's, uh, let's end the, uh, the use of, of taking away people's uh, freedoms because of uh, they have done something and serve their debt to society. And so now we feel like we still need to make sure they don't have a place to live or a decent job or uh, can vote or own a firearm or any of those things. Um, so let's get rid of that. Uh, let's, let's stop locking up people who are not violent um, and, and are not causing physical harm to other people. And let's, let's start figuring out what to do with the lots amount of people who are physically dangerous that are walking around in our societies uh, and the ridiculous amount of, of rapes that go unsolved or, or unchecked and the, the amount of stolen cars that just get stacked up because we're too busy locking up uh, drug addicted humans um, that need services. So start giving them services. We can, we can decriminalize drugs um, and, and save ourselves a whole lot of spots in prisons that way. So I think even just doing that like group of seven or eight things would alleviate so much of the problem. Um, as an abolitionist, I obviously like, like that rabbit hole continues to go forever mm -hmm. um, for me because I believe that we have a better way in society. The, the biggest one that you just said and mentioned is about drugs for me. Because if you look at the background of people who become addicted to these... Um, these felony level drug possessions that they end up getting these these are people the majority of the time coming from horrible backgrounds child abuse horrible uh, mental abuse all these things that happen at a young age are typically people who end up becoming heavily addicted to uh, really really bad substances but then we just we're just throwing them in jail this man this is one that boils my blood the fact that society looks at this I, I mean, it's just one of those things where I'm like society, and I try to tell people this, that we will come up with a law because we cannot find the solution to the problem. There, there is an obvious problem here. I don't, 
we as a society or the ruling people of this society do not want to take the time to even attempt to solve this problem. So let's just fucking make it illegal and then just put you back behind bars. It, it, laws are literally, in, in the best way that I can put it, um, they're, they can't solve a problem, so they just make it illegal. It's like a band-aid. Yeah, because, because they're not smart enough to come up with the solution to, to this actual thing. No, the drug one for me, like I said, really, really hits home uh, for me. And th- that's the most frustrating one for me. I really like what uh, like what Washington uh, Washington's been doing as far as their level of decriminalization on every level. I say that on this podcast all the time. I think everything should be perfectly legal to do, and that law enforcement should not. If you're nonviolent in Was any it way, Washington or Oregon? It's Oregon. Yeah, it's Oregon. Oh my bad, my yeah. bad, my bad. Oregon, my bad. Uh, no, I believe. Well, first of all, I'm a libertarian, and I believe in people's freedoms. You should be able to do whatever you want to. But th- this is not solving their problem of, of these people with addictions and, and horrible past. All you're doing is tacking on to their pain. And I, and I hate sitting back watching that. It's something that infuriates me so much that they're only causing these people more pain in the end and then fueling probably what brings them to the drug in the fucking first place. And I'm like, man, and you just don't care. But they, they make money off of it, though. Anyway, that's the one that really boils my blood. But Yeah. No, it's a huge percentage of the prison population. Um, just drug addicted people. I mean, it's also become the catch all for mental illness, right? There is no, there are no services anymore. Um, that doesn't really exist. Uh, and doesn't really exist for hardly anybody. Um, you, you know, uh, so we've we've come to that point where uh, where we have we have to start to take action. Um, and I don't even really believe in, in taking action through politics. I don't believe it's an effective use of our time. Right. Um, but I, I do believe that there's lots of things that we can do to support incarcerated people to, uh, to kind of lead, lead the, 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 the drive of, of what needs to happen um, and how to stop the brutalization of people. I think that... Um... <clears throat> Throughout all of this, and I think it's a good segue to to talk about what you know uh, the most, in, in my opinion, just based off having a conversation with you today. Um, we talk about all these things, and what are, and what are the answers? And we, we we and within this past thirty minutes, we've we've covered a lot of ground, honestly, on what needs to happen in America. But in in my opinion, what I've seen firsthand, what causes a lot of these people to become incarcerated, is something happened at childhood. With, um, Something happened traumatically to these people when they were kids. And, and a lot of things happen to kids, right? But what causes them to go through these types of um, spurts where they want to commit a crime, you know, whether it's, you know, something that would be justifiable to have some sort of help from someone. I'm not saying be incarcerated because right now we're, we're past that. We're not going to incarcerate anybody anymore. We're going to actually help them. Um, that's the first thing that we should do. But you, you talk about um, you do have some knowledge in child trauma or trauma in general. We've talked about a lot on the podcast. A lot of the things that happen to people, right. like I said, that, that creates this is something that happens when you're kids. And what fuels that is the propaganda that happens on a massive scale from multimedia conglomerations or whatever you want to call it. Whatever Whoever's in control of this system has kind of created this am I, am I wrong in saying that or is, I know there are ter- types of trauma that happen within families but I feel like a large part of that is this perpetual conversation that we started at the beginning with right no it's I mean poverty is traumatic right um, and so uh, we have we have just come to a point in our economic cycles um, there's a lot, large amount of people who do not have, uh, and there's a very small amount of people who have um, just like a like an unconceivable amount of resources. Um, and so, when that happens, and when that trauma of poverty um, is continues to 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 affect a community, generation after generation, because we also know. Uh, that generation after generation trauma is compounded in DNA, um, which, uh, which is something they call uh, intergenerational trauma uh, or epigenetics. Um, there's been some really interesting studies done on the children of Holocaust survivors 
um, and how the experiences of their parents um, altered the the DNA sequencing that was passed down to the next generation. Trauma can be um, genetic. Levels of anxiety. Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt yeah. you. That's just yeah, I never heard. I didn't. I, know, I didn't either. know that. That's wild. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. Trauma is genetic and it makes, it makes perfect sense if you, especially, I mean, I'm a real, like, I, th I think in a evolutionary biology kind of way when I'm, when I'm practicing th therapy, right? Like, like what is this thing um, that is happening and how has it served us at some point in the past, right? Because good, these strong traits are passed down. Um, so if I am living on the savannah and there is a giant tiger with giant teeth that I know eats people, um, when I see it and I'm triggered emotionally, it's a great idea for that process to be passed down to my, to my next generation, right? So it's, um, the, the thought process is the same about like why, like so why do people have such a reaction to snakes or spiders um, or, or, you know, things that are dangerous? Um, uh, it, whether or not we know that it's dangerous, it's, it's inherent in our bodies. Um, so if, if your parents lived through something as atrocious as uh, the, the German Holocaust, um, then, then, then you, then it would, it would behoove of biology uh, for you to be um, extra aware of your surroundings, right? And to have a little bit more anxiety about uh, the world around you because of the experiences um, of your parents. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of really cool research that's come out in the last 10 years about epigenetics and that, and it really, it crosses over to communities that are, that are being incarcerated at, at larger levels, right? Um, and it, it, it crosses over to um, the way those communities interact with policing. Um, so if, if the generations that came before you had trauma at the hands of slave patrols, which later became the police department, um, you're probably less likely to to feel safe around individuals that that mimic um, those kind of uh, traumatic relationships of the past, um, and so in the same way, when you're talking about economics, if 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 I if if my family has been living as an oppressed uh, community for five or six generations, um, all of that trauma becomes compounded. And, uh, and, and, and is, is no longer able to fit into uh, to what rational current society says it should. That's, man, I, I, it all makes sense. It's just so crazy. I've never, I've never once heard about that being like genetic. And it makes sense when you explain it in the tiger sense or even like, man, talking about like slavery and slave masters and then police and I don't want to get I don't want to get too political with all this but then that like just a cultural change because yeah. of genetics that I, I don't know I just never thought of it being genetic is what I'm saying even if it's only a small percentage or just a little bit that affects you like on a small level like it makes perfect sense I've just never thought of it that way do you so do you think that a lot of the a, a lot of what you're describing when it comes to early childhood trauma which <clears throat> you've worked with that's where a lot of that comes from, and that's where it results into the incarceration of a lot of these people. I mean, I know there's right. So, if, especially when you when you mix, go ahead. No, no, you're good. Sorry. Okay. Especially when you mix it with the way that policing is done. Um, so, if 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 I have uh, grown up, and even if even if you take out the epigenetics or the genetic component um, of trauma, um, if I have lived, if my lived experience. Is, 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 is negative of a certain, a certain kind of person, um, then, then my reactions are going to trigger a fight, flight, or freeze response um, just naturally, right? So what we have is a, a, a policing unit that is trained, the way they're trained is to trigger a fight, flight, or freeze response um, in order to gain an upper hand on a situation, right? So like the yelling, the hollering, the rapid commands, flashing lights, like all of these things are designed to, to shut down the part of your brain that causes you to think rationally. Um, so, so let's combine that with a person who, who because of lack of nutrition, because of maybe not having 
uh, both their parents in the home. Maybe having one parent incarcerated or both parents incarcerated has also experienced trauma through their life. So that same part, the prefrontal cortex is not completely developed. It's not completely developed in most males until 24. But if you have a lot of trauma, it really never quite develops. Um, so those rational thinking skills, especially under duress, um, just, just aren't there. Uh, so also combine this with the police force that is largely made up of people who have been traumatized themselves on the job uh, or traumatized themselves before getting the job in combat um, and are, are part of a, uh, a, a work culture that doesn't encourage mental health intervention, in fact, discourages mental health intervention. Um, so they're living with PTSD um, actively. Um, they're being triggered by the suspect. The suspect's being triggered by them. They're both going into a trauma response. Um, and it's, it's no wonder we see um, that go awry so many times. Um, and and this, this same thing plays out over and over and over again. And so I imagine to some people, it begins to feel very targeted because uh, in many ways, we have the, stat, the, the stats to show that it is targeted, um, that this continuous traumatic assault uh, happens frequently um, to a community. That's so, deep, man. That's deep. And, and, and it's really interesting, and, and, by the way. And whether That's or not it, and, and, and it probably does target one community more than the other, but specifically what it targets is poor communities. Um, and then there are poor communities throughout the United States. It doesn't matter what race yeah. you are, but it, it does target those types of people. And damn, man, that's crazy. The fact that cops are always going to I do, will. cops are always going to do what they're told to do. And that's just arrest people. They're going to, and I'm not talking about quotas here, but they're going to, they're, they're there to make money. They're there to, to generate revenue for whatever the city is that they live right. in or the state. They're not there for the mental health aspect like you just described. They're not there to solve the issue. They're just there to confront it. They're not actually there for the betterment of the community. Exactly. They're that, a private they're yeah. a privatized company, basically, the right. police are. Where do where do we, how did we get to that point, man? Because how do you sign up for a job like that? I, I mean, that's just it's man, Jesus Christ. Also talk about the training, just real quick. I know like right. you were asking him yeah. about like where that came from, but I mean look at the amount of training that US police get. It takes longer to be in school to fucking cut hair in the United States than it does before they give you a badge and a gun. This is absolutely ridiculous to me. Like, if the one thing you can do is just, man, just give them some more fucking training. Well, I mean, like, you wanna, before you give them on. a gun and a badge, I don't. I mean, you give them more training. Like, at least you're gonna at get, least do that for me. Like, I don't feel like that's not. Yeah, but then there's too much. there's still a problem with the what Paul's or sorry, not to put words in your mouth, but. What I think we're saying is the fact that even regardless, even if you train them for two years, the issue is still that the the point of it is to make money. The point of it is not to make the community better. It's literally to make money. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. And I, I do want to like on your point, Paul, that like absolutely there's there's a whole lot of class that 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 goes into this. And there's like the police have been used to oppress class for a long time and oppress, oppress labor movements and to um, to keep communities under control um but there is like there we don't have to go into it um uh, but there is absolutely a race component um that is involved and it, it absolutely does does make a difference and I, I just from my own like personal experience my skin color has kept me out of prison um and I, i'm not going to go into details about <laughs> about that um but uh absolutely like it matters um to what degree you're going to be incarcerated, how long you're going to be incarcerated for the same crimes, um, how your race is going to be used in prison, um, and 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 how your race is going to be aligned with the positions of power or not, um, does it makes a huge a huge different difference in that system and the people who are in that system. Also, not not to bring this up and not to interrupt you real quick, but a lot of things, uh, especially it's weird to say this in this day and age in society where we are. But women are charged with the same crime as a men, as men, but get less time for that. That's that's been proven. So there is honestly, from even like a judicial level, like this. Oh, you're you're a white woman. I'm not gonna come down nearly as hard as I would come down on a black man. And this this is like complete. Like the numbers are there. That's like you the can't. Sy that's the systemic part. Yeah, of it you all. you really can't ignore this. Like like the numbers are there for this. 
Thank but in, but anyway, that's just another thing. It comes down to gender too. Every everything's affected uh, yeah. by that. Right. And I think to your point, Paul, like as OJ Simpson said, right? He said, "I'm not black. I'm OJ." Um, that there comes a point where uh, where anyone can can become um, the anyone can become white, no matter what color their skin is, um, based on on a lot of other factors um, in in many ways. Um, although, although still, <laughs> we'll we'll be we'll be experiencing things different than you or I would. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, a lot of that's very. Interesting. I think. They, I was just, go ahead. What were you gonna? No, no, you're good, man. Okay, well, I was just gonna say, and I think it's so crazy to me to think that a lot of people like. They'll say like, "Oh man, we need to get over this whole racism thing. Racism isn't a th- racism isn't a thing anymore, or it's not systemic racism. It's blah blah blah." Like, we we've got over it. That was so long ago. Well, first off, against that argument is the fact that it wasn't long ago. Like, it wasn't that long ago. Everybody acts like it was so long ago. Two hundred years is nothing. That's how many generations is that? Four. Four generations, roughly. I mean, like that. Two hundred years is nothing at all. We, we are not that highly developed to where we can adapt and change no, over that much this is over different. 200 years. Like, we can have this conversation. We're doing the same shit people were doing 200 years ago. It's just technology has changed. But we, hold on. we can have like, this that's, conversation that's a thousand is. years from now, sure. Well, hold but on. I mean, this like this stuff is not something that's just like going to be over because it's old news. Like For, this is still young. Like So, Mikey, before you go into this, I just want to say this, man. I feel like and in, in, in you look out throughout the history of time and and. I definitely don't condone racism in any way, shape, or form, man. I, I believe that we're all here and we're all one. But every every race has, or every skin color has been um, throughout the, the the course of human history under some type of slavery. Whether you're Asian, white, black, brown, whatever you are, they've been under some sort of slavery for a long period of time. And I'm not getting the fact that it, the, the the conditions that they lived or what they had to go through was horrendous. It truly was. But I feel like if we continue to play this race narrative. Um, that it's only going to perpetuate more government and it's going to per- per- perpetuate more divide like it is right now. You see how divided the country is with race. It's absolutely astronomical because of the way that the media is portraying the, the types of environments that are happening right now. What I'm saying, what I'm strictly saying is we have to move past that. Um, like you said, Mikey, slavery still exists within our prison systems um, and, and it's majority to the black community. But it doesn't mean that it still doesn't exist for the white community. There are still a small percentage of the people who are incarcerated who are involved in that slave system. We're all involved in a slave system, and it's called um, the U.S. government, or it's called whatever the whatever's going on right now. Is it is is, is extensive of what the black community is experiencing? Most likely not. But multiple races are experiencing some type of slavery, and if we can't move past that, in my opinion then we have nowhere else to go. Do we have to confront it head on and face it? Yeah, 100%. But at the same time, we have to we have to be one together to get over this overarching government or overarching like world order, whatever it is. And I should, I agree, and I should clarify. Whenever I say, obviously, yes, we should be able to move past it. And I'm not, the media does a terrible job of making race wars and making class wars and fueling us to fight each other. All I was saying is for the people who act like there are, is no systemic racism or whatsoever, right. that to me is absurd. Like, you have to see that there is some. I, I understand where you're coming from with this, Paul, and I think really where I stand on this isn't, and, and I agree with you, that obviously, like, that still happens all the time. I mean, the numbers are there for it. You, you, can't, you can't deny it whenever it comes to, like, like race-level shit and how people are treated differently. But I think the biggest difference, which people, like, don't want to recognize is um, we literally almost have a class system based upon wealth. We've had this absolute 1% take over and, f- like, run the shit out of our government almost into the ground a couple times. We've had to bail these horrible people out on multiple occasions because they're they're gambling literally with the U.S. economy. We always have to come back and bail them out and all this. And I'm like, the re- the divide here isn't, isn't a race thing so much uh, whenever it comes to just the classification of people. It is really a wealth differential, which we need to address. I think, and once you address that, uh, and then you can really start fixing things. But there, there is always going to be that too. I, which I should probably, 
I don't know. I need to be more in depth with that. But but that that's that's my take on that. No, I mean money is absolutely an important part of it. But I don't think that I don't think that the the way that we feel that the race problem of the United States um, was solved um, was ever solved. And I think that the media, although I don't consume a whole lot of media in these days, I think the, it's not that the media is. Um, I mean, let's be honest, the media is, their job is to sell advertisement space, right? So beyond that, um, that's their responsibility. Um, and, and they have a legal responsibility to their shareholders to sell advertisement space. Um, so if we look to them for anything other than that, are, we are, are, are the dummies. That's um, what I've yeah, always, right oh my God. Good for you, Mikey. Done. I'm sorry, good that's what I've you, always Mikey. fucking said is that it's for entertainment, advertisement, and money. Yeah. If you get there your you news, go. sorry. It's, you very, go. it's very beautiful you said that, but unfortunately that's not the case, and people watch that shit hook, line, and sinker. That's their fucking fault. I know. So many, I know. so many old people are right, literally just eating, oh. eating the shit out of MSNBC and fucking Fox News, and mm -hmm. oh no, this is exactly how it is in my world, Like, and that's sitting in front of the TV just absorbing it. I'm like, man, you're fucking, you're an idiot. But anyway. Right. And we've got to stop pretending that they have some sort of responsibility to educate the, the, the working class. Um, and once we like kind of get over that, uh, we can move on. And in this, like to the same degree of like this problem of race has not been solved because we have not, we've never come to a point to, to admit um, as a, as a society um, kind of the the cornerstone of our society, which is a race based society, um, and and it is becoming glaringly clear how divided of a race based society we are to white America in the last uh, ten years. I don't think that anybody, any person of color that you would ask, um, not any, many people of color that you would ask um, would say that this has been a problem my whole life, like. Um, this isn't a new problem. Um, police brutality is not a new problem. Um, and and locking up my family members for minor offenses is not a new problem or because they have a mental illness. Like this isn't a new problem or being targeted driving through. I'll, can I tell you a quick story of uh, being in Belton in high school and I hung out with, uh, with, with two, two black men who, um, who, I don't know if, if you know them, Paul, but one of them lived at the, uh, at the Marine base. His dad was a Sergeant Major, and the other was a, uh, a Nigerian, his parents were Nigerian immigrants, um, and, and they were both very good students and incredibly human beings. We got pulled over in Belton one night, and uh, immediately the police, um, what's your name, boy? Shine a flashlight in their faces. Didn't say a word to me. How do I know you? I've seen you somewhere. Um, and, and the friend who lived on the base had to, uh, we talked about it afterwards. He said it was one of the, the scariest moments of his life where he raised his voice to the police officer and said, I don't know, maybe you know my father, the Sergeant Major uh, at the Marine base. Um, and we just kind of sat there real tensely for a few seconds. And, um, and then they ran the plates and, and let us go. Uh, and the only reason we got pulled over is because there were two black kids driving a, an old Buick um in belton and this was 20 20 years ago this is in the 90s um so so i don't know how much has changed um but i know then it was a problem and i know that every time i went out with them i got followed in a in a store um and i never got followed otherwise um and and really like those years were a reckoning for me that, that race is a problem in this country um when i stopped and i started listening to what what these guys were telling me happened in their lives and happened all the time um and i was like oh shit like, I thought that we were equal, uh, and I thought that, uh, that there was all these stresses that were gone, but, um, but those things still play true today. Uh, and when you look at the numbers of people who are incarcerated, um, you can come to one or two conclusions. It's either uh, we have a race-based injustice system, um, or we have a race of people that are just inherently bad. Um, and so I, I don't know if there's any other, like, a logical like way to explain those statistics um, but to me that's the only other way and I'm not I'm not prepared to say that one race of people is just worse than the other um, but I am prepared to say that this system is based on racial oppression um, and profits from it through 
the prison system. And once that is, is managed, um, so many of these other uh, economic problems will fall into place. Very yeah. interesting. And, I, and, and <clears throat> yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I listen to a lot of the things that you say and I, and I can't, I get it, man. Um, it all makes complete sense. Um, but I mean, I, and, and, I, and I'm not disagreeing with what you're saying, but I grew up very poor and I, I don't, I don't really know how to describe it, man. Like mm-hmm. I wasn't fortunate in the least. Um, I've been arrested on, on multiple occasions just based on my own doings. Um, I feared for my life, you know, in certain situations I've had SWAT team in my house. Um, or not, well, it was in my house. I lived in a trailer at the time I had SWAT team in my house. Like I've been through traumatic experiences based upon my own doings. And, and I'm not saying that there are certain people out there who are targeting people of color. I think that that definitely does exist. But to say that, like, I mean, like me as a, as a white individual, like being brought up in a, in a poor environment and, 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 and then being an adult and making the wrong decisions and still say, uh, facing the repercussions of, of those decisions, like that exists too. You know what I'm saying? And I'm not, I'm not trying to say that I'm like, like that I'm better or anything like that. But what I'm saying is it exists for everyone who is, who is poor or who doesn't have money. Like there is a type of racism out there that is out to get everyone, not just a specific color. And I get what you're saying, Mikey. Like, I truly understand what you're saying, but we had like, like, man, I lived in a, there's a, a big, there's right, a bigger yeah, problem I, I, too. Dude, besides I, just you're, race. you're talking financial. Well, there's a bigger problem besides just not, race. Not, not financial. Like I grew up in a, right. white, I grew no. up in a, I grew up in a one bedroom apartment with five people, man, like with five people and roaches and, and didn't right, know, right, didn't right. didn't know what I was gonna eat. I was eating right, bread and right. bread and butter and shit like that. Like man, like I, I I've been at, at the lowest right. I could ever be, and I and right. and I know that there are other like er, a lot of people have to go through with that. And I mean, you, you see where I'm coming from, though, man. Like I I don't know right. how to explain it. Right, 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 right. No, no, I know completely. I mean, I was I was in the free lunch line myself, right? Like and and. But one person's oppression doesn't negate another person's oppression, right? right? Like just because somebody like is is oppressed because of something doesn't mean that that you haven't clawed your way out of oppression. Also, like there's no like litmus test or like um, or like sh- struggle meter that that we're we're going off here. Um, and it can be true that we live in a in a society that is based off of racial oppression, continues to do so today, and being a poor white kid growing up in a poor white neighborhood is a fucking hard thing to do. Right. And like pulling yourself out of poverty is nearly impossible. And like takes like an uh, extra human amount of luck and work and, and just like grind to, to make it happen. Um, And even then we live in debt most of our life. Right. Like, and we're, and we're still like, like having to, to make compromises about our families and things like that based on our, our, we don't want to lose our health insurance at work. Right. We don't want to become so poor we're in prison. Um, and, and, and that doesn't, those things don't, don't negate each other and they don't uh, cancel each other out. I mean, uh, Fred Hampton talked a lot about that before the FBI murdered him. Um, that, the all, all, all people, all working people, the people need to come together and they need to, to, to fight these systems together. Yes. Um, and, yes. And reform isn't going to happen. Uh, so, yeah, that's what I'm on board for, man. I'm, I'm, you're, I'm on. That's we all need to come together, man. And I, I listen to a, a YouTube channel named Papa Duck, and he's a and he's a black gentleman, and he speaks truth, man, about the current system and what's going on. And, and I'm not saying he's 100 percent right, but a lot of the things he says, like, I mean, we got to come together. And there are a lot of people out there. Um, on both sides or three sides or four, whatever color you are, who, who are coming together and saying like, Hey man, like we got to fight this together and fight this system together. It's not, uh, it's not us against each other. It's us against the, this bigger overarching entity that is controlling us and controlling the society. When we talk about prison uh, abolition, like we can make it happen as a population. We can do it. If we sit here and and wait for the politicians to do it and, like that's never going to happen, but we're never going to unite because we're always divided by something that is always dividing us. And that's social media. It's technology that's uh, uh, evolved into our lives and we're all able to connect to each other via phone or internet or whatever it is, but we're not able to come together and, and, and stop can, something and like can, a prison system. They can just influence in a small way as to where the last thing 
that the media wants, that the upper echelon wants, is to have the white, the black, and the Latinos get together and then all of a sudden start uniting. Because then they're in fucking trouble. If they can keep us all separated and, and hitting, hitting each other a little bit, then they're fine. Because they're, man, you're worried about what I'm doing. I'm worried about what you're doing. I'm not really focused on the real problem, which is what's happening up up top, in, in my opinion. This is, and I don't... And that's what wanna, they, they I don't want to because you know, we've I mean, that's a, yeah. we've done a good job of avoiding any conspiracy theory on this podcast, which is weird because typically we'll end up going down a road of conspiracy theory. But and and I, I'm not I'm trying to do that right now. But th- I think this is a very real thing, and I'm and I'm staying in a in a real societal issue thing right now as to where all of the foundation of America is a little bit suspicious of this other group. Because of because of race or whatever, and we're a little divided when we don't even realize we are literally the backbone of this fucking country. And if we united in any way, we could change so much and create a future better for for like the entire world. Like everything kind of stems from America, right? Like we could do so much, not only for America, but for the rest of the world. I mean, but they have done a really good job. And they have some top minds on preventing that. <laughs> I will. I will say that. But I'm. I'm trying to avoid conspiracy theory here. So I'll. I'll leave it at that. No, it's. it's definitely. I don't think it's even conspiracy theory. I mean, I think it's fairly obvious. Like the way that. Um, that the the ruling class is is uh, works to keep the working class splintered, and it's you can see that microcosm in prison. I mean, I've never been in prison. Uh, but from the people who I've talked to who have been in prison, um, talking about how keeping races segregated is, uh, is a really great tool um, for the, 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 the state to, uh, to maintain power um, over people while they're incarcerated. Yeah, I mean, it so, just, seem, it's, it yeah, just seems I, like a common trend about, like, that it seems like a common trend that they do with everything. Like you said with race and it's not just race, it's poverty too, or sorry, not poverty. It's a financial status. It's they almost keep, like a class status. So you yeah, middle yeah, class, so they keep, even the class is in the fucking dude, word. The perfect example, like, the perfect example is, and I've used this one before. This was years ago, not the recent one, but years ago when they talked about like raising minimum wage and the one argument, I, and I've brought this up before, but the one argument I always heard, it would be like EMTs and paramedics who were making 15 or 16 an hour saying, Oh, why should a burger flipper who's getting paid seven twenty five? Why should they get paid fifteen an hour when I'm only getting fifteen an hour? And that's a that's a form of division right there. Because in all honesty, yo, that burger flipper, pay them fifteen an hour, let them have a livable wage. Guess what? You should be making thirty seven an hour as a paramedic, and the people way above you should not be making forty three million a year. Hard concept to grasp, Johnny. I'm just saying, man. <laughs> but that's they keep really us hard divide, to grasp. They keep us all on the same level. Against but if you each take other. money away from the rich, then they won't create jobs for us. This Reaganomics trickle down thing. Obviously, that fucking works. I'm trying to be obviously sarcastic here. Like this is a fucking laughable thing to me, as far as our <laughs> right. economics fucking goes. Anyway, right, right, right. That's another thing that boils my fucking blood. But no, but we've got we've got a lot of people who who uh, do the work for the work for, for the ruling class against the working class. So, um, so it's a, uh, and it's always been that way. Um, and it, and creating racial divisions is at the heart of that. Um, so like the stuff you're talking about, about like economic disparity, um, the racial injustice is tied in with that. Um, and so until we are able to like, like identify that, um, it's going to be impossible for us to come together as a, as a working class group of people um, and, and stake claim to the wealth that is created by us every day, right? Like no wheel turns, uh, nothing happens without, without our work. Um, and anyone who's ever worked a real job in their lives knows that there's no such thing as unskilled labor. Um, some of the hardest jobs I've had paid the least amount of money. Um, and and that's just that's just the damn truth. I get I get told or asked on the regular, not as much anymore, but it used to happen a lot where it was like, it was just for clarity's sake, I am a server slash bartender, and I make really good money, or at least I believe I make good money. I'm not going to say out loud, but it's a solid amount. It's a lot more than it's a lot more than most people would yep. assume. But 
I, I right. it used to be a thing all the time, not just from my parents, but from random customers as well. They'd be like, so what else are you doing? What's your other job? Like, what else are you, what are you trying to go for? What's your other, time, and right? I'm like, right. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, what's my other, why is this not a real thing? Or why is it, oh, it's so easy. Yeah. It's so easy to do, you, to do. you do it. Please try right. and do it and act like right. it's not skilled because I've done right. other forms of skilled labor. Like I've, I've worked in a fucking factory. I've worked as like a, a satellite technician, like dish satellites, not like fucking outer space satellites. Not that cool, but you know, right. I've, I've worked right. tons of different kind of stuff and have been in different fields. And I can tell you like, they're all challenging in their own way, even just retail or service. Like it's not an unskilled thing. It <laughs> takes a certain kind of person. Right. That's only right. older generations and that, no that shit on that. But. What's that? So no one works harder than poor people. That's right, man. It's um, true. So, well, we're uh, a little bit over the end of the hour, Mikey. Yes. I greatly appreciate your time, man. I know you got some stuff right. you got to do in the morning with your children. Go ahead, Jesse. Yeah, I, I because the the podcast sometimes talking about real life can get a little dismal, and I always like to try to end on a high note. And all all I've, I've been on the back of my mind this whole podcast, you referenced Killer Mike, and I'm like, oh my god, like I love this dude. He just referenced Killer Mike, and I. Man, I love Killer Run Mike the Jewels. Killer Mike has a lot of good shit to I, say. Dude, dude, I love I love Run the Jewels. If that's the same guy that we're talking about right now. It is. Like, dude, I, I was like, man, that this reference yeah, is stone yeah, cold yeah. badass right now. <laughs> like, so that's that's the one, like, high note that I wanted to leave with you about how cool you were coming on. <laughs> Nobody knows who the fuck Killer Mike well, is. Thank you. Like, yeah, I love Run the Jewels, man. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. If, uh, if anyone wants to get more involved in prison abolition, you look up the... Uh, Industrial Workers Organizing Committee, uh, IWOC, um, and they do a lot of work all over the place, and they meet at, at some restaurant in Kansas City to, to do that every Sunday. Um, and then there's an organization out of Alabama called the Free Alabama Movement, or FAM, um, and they do a lot of uh, justice um, centered around, around Alabama prisons. So... Um, let me know if you if you ever want any more resources. Yes, sir. And, uh, I was gonna say, yeah, if you got links to those links. too, give them yeah. give them to Paul so we can put them in the description below or whatever, so people can click on it, check it out, all that. Yeah, yeah, just shoot it to me, man. Facebook, man, and, and, it, and again, I'd love to have you on again and, and talk about some more interesting topics. I thought this was a great conversation. Oh, I yeah. really I had, enjoyed I had, it. I had so much fun. This yeah. this was fantastic. Yeah, thanks a lot, guys. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to. I, uh, I have to drink a coffee in the afternoon because I'm so old. And this is like, this is like nighttime. We got to get you, we got to get you off that dial up too. Yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah. We need to get you some better internet for sure. <laughs> he, he's, he's in peculiar. He lives in Michigan. So he's only in town by, by chance. Oh, so, okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Michigan okay. doesn't have internet. They have fucking Dude, sand dunes his, still. His mom lives way out like 230th and Y. That's the kind of internet he's oh, on right now. Oh shit. Yeah. Oh, there's no fixing that, man. Yeah. There, okay. There's no fixing that. He naturally froze. Oh, the hands. irony of that! As <laughs> oh, we just as have the a video, frame. the video like goes out. <laughs> oh, is you it... still there? There's no way that that's that ironic, that we lost him right then talking about his uh, internet. Maybe it is. That's crazy. Yeah. That's insane. I'll, I'll Facebook message him. But there you have it, man. Mikey, uh, a good buddy of mine uh, from way back in high school. That's crazy. Mikey it was great having you on. Oh man, and again they got big, and then oh, Michael Harder. That's the, that's the way to leave, bro. That's oh, oh okay. no, it's okay. perfect timing. That's <laughs> oh, you beautiful. switched the internet. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, I didn't switch. Oh, okay. It's just, it just like kind of screwed off on you. You can't talk about it. I get it. You can't, time. you can't talk about it. Well, it gets you, shy. You've been so, you've been so <laughs> tiny the whole time, and now you're full screen on our, on our TV that we're looking at. So If you're using your hotspot, man, this is working way better because yeah. I have a feeling it's much more interactive. We should have done that through okay. the whole podcast. but Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, no delay yep. right well, there. Well, we'll figure it out for next time. Thanks for having me, y'all. Yes, sir. Have a good night, brother. Take it easy, Mikey. All right. There you have See it, ya. ladies. See ya. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Mikey, uh, just uh, a, a Belton alumni, just a, a good, you know, good friends with it, or was good friends with uh, his brother, Timmy, and just a fun conversation. It was, it was yeah. solid. I didn't know what to expect at all, to be honest, because I didn't know anything about Mikey. I enjoyed it. I, I, I love, man, you never know what you're going to get, and I picked up so many new viewpoints on certain things that I'm 
I'm like, oh man, that makes perfect fucking sense. Biggest thing for me was that and Civil never, War thing. Yeah. The Civil War and the prisons after the Civil War, like that, like really resonated. Where I was like, holy fuck, I have never thought about that. Yeah. I mean, never learned so about that. Cool the most shit. okay, and, and this this was my goal with the podcast was just bringing up knowledge to people that they really have never heard of, and we've had a lot of that on the podcast. But specifically from whatever side it is, it doesn't matter, man. Yeah. I mean, I would, I'd be willing to have anyone on our show, whether it's far left, far right, in the middle, somewhere in between. I don't care, man. If you have a, a, some knowledge to spread to people on this podcast, that's all it's about. Man, not, very, that's what I like about this podcast. Not yeah. to suck our own dicks right now, but like that's my favorite part about this is that it's just a conversation, man. Yeah. So if you guys like this conversation, the best thing you could do is comment on the video. If you want to... Share this video. Um, subscribe to the channel. That would be dope as well. Um, all those things would help this channel because we are combating a very shadow banning type of... Uh, it's that algorithm. Algorithm that YouTube <laughs> has that us algorithm. on. And, and even iTunes and Spotify, man. Like We, we really need to jump in, in a bolster, man, from the community. If you guys could really help us out, that would be awesome. If not, it's, it's no worries. Just, uh, just keep on listening to us weekly. Uh, if our number stays at 600 subscribers for the next 10 years... I know I'll still be here. I don't know about these two, but <laughs> we'll still be doing it. I don't know where. I might, I don't, who knows? Yeah, I'll be here every Sunday doing it, man, because I, I truly enjoy it and love having conversation. But uh, I mean, I'm planning on starting up a podcast next week called Junkies Talk. <laughs> and, you know, just going to run with that. Yeah, so. I feel you. Man, that's, <laughs> uh, dude, that's crazy timing because two weeks from now, I was going to start Jock Tunkies. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But all our junkies out there. Stay fly and ring the bell. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>